how we think about different types of hubs and brain networks, and we're going to talk about modules and modularity analysis, and also uh, thinking about defining subsets of nodes that represent perhaps information processing pores in the network. So a few different topics to cover. Uh, again, just uh, raise your hand if you've got any questions. Um, but we'll try and keep the time so if they're running behind, then I might just kind of zoom through and grab you at the break. So it's a button on this. So yeah, that's just saying what I just said. They're the topics we're going to cover today. So we'll start with uh, small worlds. Is the mic on? Sorry, oh, yeah. I need to. Uh, so we'll start with small worlds. So as I mentioned yesterday, uh, a small world network is uh, sort of an uh, intermixed between a completely regular network and a random network. So a regular network has high clustering but long average path length. A random network has low clustering but low average path length. And, and Andrew explained what path length was yesterday. So uh, Watson Strogatz, in their experiment, they started with this regular network and they just randomly rewired the edges. And as they rewire more and more edges, they approach this fully random organization. Uh, and as they did that, at each point, they measure the clustering of the network and the path length of the network. So here, this is the clustering of the network. As we move along the x-axis, we're rewiring, rewiring more and more edges. So we're going from the regular configuration to the random configuration. And you can see that the clustering declines quite slowly, whereas the path length, you only rewire a few edges and you get a dramatic drop in path length. So you get this regime here in which we've seen both high clustering and low average path length, and that's the regime in which small world networks exist. <coughs> so as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, path length, which is just the number of edges, the short, on the shortest path between two nodes, as you heard about yesterday. And clustering is the number of closed triangles attached to a node, or the proportion of closed triangles attached to a node. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more how we define clustering, uh, and then talk about how that relates to how we uh, can quantify small wellness. Now, clustering is actually, although the idea uh, from Watson Strogatz came from thinking about social networks, it actually seems like it's quite an important property of brain networks. And it's interesting to revisit uh, the study by uh, White and Sidney Brenner in 1986 where they completely mapped the nervous system of the nematode worm C. elegans using electron microscopy, so looking, reconstructing every single neuron and synapse in the worm. So this was a kind of really landmark paper published in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. It's, it's hundreds of pages long, at least over 100 pages long. Um, and just qualitatively, they, they, they note this. They say, one of the striking features of the connectivity diagrams is a high incidence of triangular connections linking three classes. A typical neuron in C. elegans is accessible to a fairly limited subset of the total complement of neurons, but it's fairly highly locally connected within this subset. So that's saying it's accessible to uh, only a subset, but it's very locally connected within the subset. Thus, if a neuron has synaptic contacts with two partners, these partners must be neighbors to the neuron and therefore are likely to be neighbors themselves. So basically saying it's likely that we get lots of closed triangles. It is therefore quite probable that given the high level of connectivity, there will be a synaptic contact between them, which will close the triangle. The abundance of triangular connections in the nervous system of C. elegans may thus be simply a consequence of the high levels of connectivity that are present within neighborhoods. So this was, this was just a, a qualitative observation saying that we find in local subsets of neurons, we find lots of these closed triangular motifs. And then uh, over 10 years later, Watson Strogatz kind of developed a method for quantifying this tendency that's uh, generally applicable to all different types of networks. So how do we actually measure this? Well, the basic idea is that we take a node, so node I, 
and we look at the pairs of nose, nose, eyes, neighbors that are connected, so the number of closed triangles, as a ratio of the total number of node, eyes, neighbors. All right, so formally we can write this as this expression. So this is, we're talking about a specific node here, node I. Ti is the number of closed triangles attached to a node. And this expression in the denominator is the total possible number of connections attached to node I. Right? So this is uh, K, which is the degree of a node. So uh, K by K, that's basically K squared minus K, which is the full connectivity of uh, the subnetwork of nodes attached to node I. And we use two here because it's an undirected network, so we're counting things twice. So we can estimate this for each node, and we can do this for the entire network just by taking the mean. Right, so this is just the mean of all the nodal values. Right, so fairly straightforward uh, definition. It's basically the likelihood of finding a closed triangle attached to node I. Now, that's for binary networks, binary undirected networks. In the case of weighted networks, it's a little bit different because we want to factor in the weights in some way. And this is one popular definition from an Alaron colleagues. Uh, this is one that is implemented in the BCT, the Brain Connectivity Toolbox. And so again, you know, we see this factor here, which is the total number of node eyes neighbors, so we're normalizing by that. Over here, we've got the weight of the link attached, linking node I and J, the weight linking node J and K, and the weight linking node K and I, right? So the weights on all three edges in a given triangle. And this uh, is basically a measure of what you would say the subgraph intensity, and it's actually the geometric mean. So the geometric mean is just another method for taking an average, and it's uh, very useful when you're taking an average over measures that have been normalized with respect to some value because it's invariant to whatever quantity you use for the normalization. And so in this case, what we do is we normalize the weights with respect to the maximum in the network. Right? So then that means the normalized weights, the maximum will always be one. Right? So if there's a weight on an edge that is equal to the maximum, one over the, the basically that value divided by itself, so it's one. And so then our weights range between uh, zero and one. So these values range between 0 and 1. And we take the geometric mean normalized by the total connectivity. So again, because the max is 1 here, it's almost like we're dealing with a binary graph. Right? So then we just normalize by the number of connections, which uh, you know, in this particular case could be equivalent as the maximum total weight. So just to kind of make that a little bit more concrete, say we've got a closed triangle here. We've got node i, node j, node k. In this case, all the edge weights are the same and they have the maximum value, so a value of one. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a closed triangle, but these two edges have a max value. This edge is half that, so 0.5, and an open triangle here. Right? So what would we get if we applied this to these three triangles? So here I've just got some MATLAB code that will just uh, estimate this quantity for these three uh, triangles. So in this case, all the edge weights are one. So we say, okay, the max weight is one. These are the edge weights for each of the edges, i to j, i to k, j to k. So we're saying in this case, it's one, one over the max, so it's going to be one. The node degree of node i is two, right? Node i has two connections. This is the expression for computing the weighted clustering. It's just the formula I showed before, just for node i. And we get an answer of one, right? So one being the maximum level of clustering. Now, it doesn't matter what weight I have on these edges, right? So I could assign 50, and 50 is the maximum, and I'll get the same answer, one, right? Because we're always normalizing by the maximum weight. In this case, all the edges have the maximum weight, so uh, we get the same response, the same answer. Now take this triangle where we've got two edges that have a maximum weight, one and one, and this edge has uh, half that. So here, max weight is 50, i to j is 50, i to k is 50, j to k is 25. So it's half, and degree is two again, put it through our equation, we had a clustering of 0.79. Right, so it's a little bit less than this case, and that makes sense because in this case, all the edges have maximum weight, 
in this case, uh, only two edges have that, and one of the edges is most of the lower weight. So we get a lower weighted cluster. In the case of the open triangle, it's, it's an open triangle, right? So we would expect that there will be clustering of zero. Right? And so this is what actually happens. Maximum weight 50, I to J is 50, I to K is 50, J to K is zero. And then when we put it through this expression, everything gets multiplied by zero. So you know, as soon as you've got a zero in there, you end up with zero. So basically, in the, this sort of shows two things. So one, it shows that you know, as the weights vary, even though the binary topology is the same, so in this case, all three triangles are connected, but the weights change, we get variation in the clustering coefficient. But in the case where all the weights have the same and maximal weight, then this, the solution is identical to what you would get with the binary. And in the case of an open triangle, again, the solution is identical to what you would get with the binary clustering coefficient of zero. Any questions about that? Now, that's just one way of defining weighted clustering. And there's been several other definitions that have been proposed. I'm not going to go into these. Um, this review by Saramaki kind of goes into the various pros and cons if you're interested. Now, here they outline some of the different properties. And it turns out that this metric from Onella has you know, some of the kind of properties that you might think might be sensible for a weighted clustering coefficient. That's why I focused on that one here. And this is what's used in the brain connectivity toolbox. But if you're interested, you can, you can check out these papers. In directed networks, it's a bit different because now we've got arrows on the edges. And so then we can have uh, different types of triangles depending on the, the way in which the arrows are running. And uh, essentially, we can have eight different directed triangles based on uh, the patterns of flow in the networks. And this is the general formula for computing it. Again, I'm not going to go into the details because most of what we're doing in imaging is focused on undirected networks. Um, but if you're interested, there's this paper here by Fajola that just describes the logic and rationale of it. So uh, I think yesterday I might have mentioned, I'm not sure if it was an lecture or a conversation with someone, the idea of a clique. And a clique is a fully connected subgraph of a network. So, Basically, if I take a subset of nodes, each node is connected to every other network in, uh, node in that graph. And so you can think of a triangle as a clique. It's a fully connected subgraph of three nodes. But we can generalize this concept to look at uh, four clicks, five clicks. So in each case, each node is connected to every other node. Right? And so we could extend this out to larger and larger subgraphs. And uh, you know, there are different algorithms for doing this. Uh, it turns out this seems to be an interesting property of the brain. So in a study of the macaque connector derived from track tracing, this was a very dense network. They've got kind of quite large sort of uh, anatomical areas. And so the binary, in terms of just looking at binary connections, which, which areas are connected with which, it's, it's a very dense network. Uh, and they found that you get 13 different clicks uh, comprising 10 nodes. And so this just shows uh, you know, each region, which clique it's involved in. Uh, and this just shows the, the anatomical distribution of each clique on a, uh, on a flat map. So I'm just kind of pointing out that this, this idea of clustering is a specific case of a more general property of uh, maximally connected cliques in graphs. So you heard about path length yesterday. I've just uh, explained clustering to you today. So now you kind of know the ingredients of what goes into a small world network. But one of the critical things to note here is that in this plot, we've got this uh, normalization factor here, this denominator. And this is the clustering obtained in a comparable random graph, in the path length in a comparable random graph. So really, when we're saying that uh, a network has either high clustering or low clustering or high path length or low path length, we're usually saying that it's relative to a random graph. Right? And so then if we're going to try and define a measure of small worldness, we need to consider, well, what, what, what kind of, how do our measures uh, match up to what we find in a random graph? So if you remember in lecture one, I sort of said that 
Now, null models are important because they provide a benchmark for telling us the kind of uh, um, magnitude of measures that we would expect by chance. And so if we measure a property such as clustering or path length in a network, then we want to say, well, does this deviate from a random organization? So it's common to uh, normalize our clustering estimates by the estimates we observe in a set of randomized networks. Again, this afternoon, you're going to hear in more detail how we go about generating those. And so typically, we'll generate many different randomized networks, because each time you randomize a network, it's going to be a bit different. So you do it enough times, and you take the mean, you get a kind of average estimate, try and smooth out some of that noise. So this is just saying we can derive a normalized estimate of clustering called gamma, where it's the observed clustering over the mean of an ensemble of randomized networks. And so in this case, uh, if the network has type clustering, gamma should be greater than 1. Right? So if, cluster, if the observed clustering is greater than the random, gamma should be greater than 1. We can do the same for normalized path length. This time we call it lambda. So we've got the observed path length over the average in a set of randomized networks. And you know, if you think that a random network has just about you know, the lowest average path length you could get, then if uh, the network has very short average path length or is highly efficient, then we would expect lambda to be close to 1. Uh, that's actually wrong. That shouldn't be greater than. It should be close to equal, approximately equal. So then, using these two normalized quantities, you sort of think, well, if a small world network has higher clustering than a random graph, but comparable average path length, then we could devise a measure of small worldness called sigma, which is just the ratio of clustering to uh, normalized clustering to normalized path length. And so in this case, if a network is small world, that will have a sigma value greater than 1. And this will occur if gamma is greater than 1, so we have higher clustering than expected by random, and lambda is approximately 1. Right? So we have a high numerator and uh, a fairly low denominator. And this will mean that sigma is greater than 1. And this is usually uh, used as an index to try and diagnose whether a network is small world or not in a quantitative way. Are there any questions about that? Good. Now, that's just one way of defining small worldness. There are other ways. So some have said, well, you know, a randomized network is a natural benchmark for path length. But for clustering, the natural benchmark is something more like a regular network or a lattice. So what we should do is we should normalize path length with respect to a random network and clustering with respect to a, a lattice type network. Uh, and so our telescope and colleagues define this omega index. And in this index, if you have a value near 0, you're small world. If you're negative 1, you're more like a lattice. And if you're positive 1, you're more like a random network. So this index gives you a little bit more information about the topology of the network. Uh, similarly, uh, Sarah Muldoon and Danny Bassett have proposed an alternative measure called small world propensity, but based on a roughly similar idea where you're uh, looking at how the observed network matches up relative to either a lattice or a random network. So you're accounting for both of those benchmarks or both of these extremes. Well, what is it? Sorry? What is it? Uh, so the question was, what is the difference between lattice clustering and random clustering? So uh, the clustering me measure itself is the same. It's just trying to measure a property of a network. But the, the network's different. So you can think of this. This is similar to a lattice. It's a very regular network. A lattice is a very, very regular, predictable network. Whereas this is a random network. So the idea is you would measure, you would define a lattice-like network that has the same number of nodes and edges as your empirical network. Uh, you measure clustering in that, and you're expected to be higher than your empirical network because lattices have got high clustering. Um, and then you do the same in a random network, you'd expect clustering to be lower. Right? So the idea would be your observed network would generally sit in between these two extremes if it's small world. So basically, small world is something where we need higher clustering and the decrease path length. Yes, yeah, so a, a small world network has high clustering and low average path length. But then the question is high relative to what and low relative to what? So the simplest sigma index uses 
relative to a random network. The omega index and this index look at uh, both random and lattice. They're factoring both of those benchmarks. So that's uh, how we go about diagnosing small worldness. I mean, you know, these days, small worldness is so ubiquitous that um, you know, to a certain extent, it might be a little bit trivial to say that a, a real network is small world. It would be actually more interesting to find a network that is not small world. Um, and so, I mean, just to use a global summary such as small worldness, I guess you, know, you could argue, well, what, what's the value of that? But given that it's derived from two more basic measures, clustering and path length. So, you know, usually it can be useful to really understand what's happening in terms of clustering and path length rather than jumping to the more complicated uh, small world index. Now, there's another factor to consider when we're talking about brain networks, and that's the fact that the brain is a physical object embedded in space. So, a lot of, you know, what I've been talking about so far is quite abstract. We're just talking about networks in general. We're not factoring the effect of space. But in a lot of spatial networks, if you think about the brain, if you think about um, uh, transportation networks, or electric, electrical, uh, electricity supply networks, uh, the cost of forming a connection scales with the distance between two nodes. Right? So if I'm establishing an electricity grid, I'm much, uh, I'm better off trying to uh, organize it in such a way that I've got very few long range cables because they're very costly. And the same goes for the brain. Right? So long range connections uh, require greater cellular material, they consume greater metabolic resources, they occupy more volume within the limited real estate of the skull. And so the brain tries to minimize these wiring costs wherever possible. And so we can recast this uh, spectrum between regular and random uh, by factoring in the idea of space and wiring cost. And so we can say that on the one hand we can have a simple lattice or regular topology. Uh, and this has low efficiency, so long average path length. But it's got low cost, right? Because all of the connections are short range. On the other hand, we've got this random topology, which has quite high communication efficiency. It's got low average path length, but the wiring cost is quite high, right? So I've got all these long range projections that increase my efficiency, but they cost more. So as we move to the left, we've got high cost and low efficiency. As we move to the right, we've got low cost, but uh, low efficiency. And so, you know, complex networks such as the brain, if they're small world, they might exist somewhere in between these two extremes. And you'd hope that they provide high communication efficiency for relatively low cost. And so this was shown by Latoro and Marchiori, where they repeated the watts stregatz experiment, but this time using spatially embedded networks. And so they accounted for the cost associated with each connection based on its physical distance. And so, on the x-axis, we start with a regular network. We rewire more edges until we get to a random configuration. And they measured uh, global efficiency, uh, local efficiency, which is sort of a measure of the efficiency within the local subgraphs of the network, and the wiring cost. And you can see as we move along the x-axis, we get this regime in which we see high global efficiency, high local efficiency for relatively low wiring cost. And again, this is the regime where a lot of spatial small world networks exist. And they went on to show that if you actually look at the connectomes of the macaque, the cat, and C. elegans, you've got global efficiency that's very similar to random. So 0.52 versus 0 0.57, 0 0.69 versus 0 0.69, 0 0.46 versus 0 0.48. Uh, and the cost in terms of the number of connections is fairly low. So only 18% of all possible connections 38% of all possible connections, and 6% of all possible connections. All right, so the brain, these brain networks uh, seem to be able to achieve quite relatively high communication efficiency for relatively low connection cost. Empirically, we can try and capture this trade-off between cost efficiency by defining different metrics. And so in functional MRI networks, uh, it's been shown that, you know, so if we start with a correlation network, we're gonna, we can apply lots of different thresholds and look at how the properties change as a function of threshold. So here these are fMRI networks and the x-axis is different thresholds 
uh, measuring global efficiency on the y-axis. So as we increase, if we, as we add more connections, so the network's becoming more dense, we are getting an increase in efficiency, right? And that makes sense because we're adding more direct connections between nodes, so we're reducing path length. If we measure connection costs, so this is the distance of the connections between regions, we get a roughly, well, we get a linear increase. And so the, the increase in efficiency is quicker than the linear increase in cost. So if we just subtract uh, cost from efficiency at each point, we get this inverted kind of U-shaped curve. And so you can see that at some connection density, there's a peak here. And this is the point where the network is maximally cost efficient. And so the height of this peak and the precise density at which it occurs varies across different people. And it's been shown that this variability is under strong genetic influence, so up to the 60 to 80% of the variance between people is explained by genes. And uh, it's also related to cognitive abilities. So people with more cost-efficient networks uh, tend to show better working memory performance. And so this is kind of intuitive if you think that natural selection would favor connections that would uh, confer higher communication efficiency for lower communication cost. Uh, people have actually tried to model this, so trying to grow networks based on trying to optimize this trade-off between cost and efficiency and seeing, well, do the networks look like the brain? And, um, you know, these networks are able to reproduce a lot of features, but there are other models that, that do a little bit better. So cost efficiency is in the full story, but it does seem to be a, a, an interesting genetically mediated trait. Right. So are there any questions about that? Good. So, Next, I'm going to talk about modules. And I've touched briefly on that in lecture one. So modular organization is potentially uh, a substrate for allowing brain systems to be functionally specialized and segregated to some degree. And so this is a kind of simple example of what a modular network might look like, right? So you've got subsets of nodes, you've got four here, four here. They're all densely connected with each other, but sparsely connected between modules. This is a very modular network. This is an example of a small world network, but this doesn't really have any modules. Right? And so in general, modular networks will be small world, but you can have small world networks that aren't modular. And so if you think about the brain, we know that it's modular and small world. So it seems like uh, perhaps the small world property of the brain is maybe just a secondary consequence of its modular organization. Uh, you know, so modularity analysis might be perhaps a bit of a, more of a fundamental way of thinking or, 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 or analyzing the brain. On top of that, uh, we know that many real world networks have hierarchical modular organizations. So you can see you can treat each of these subsets as a module, but we could also cluster them into larger modules. So at one level we could say, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, sixteen different modules. But at another level we could say, well, there's actually four modules because these smaller modules coalesce into larger modules. So you end up with this kind of uh, Russian doll-like organization where you get modules within sub uh, sub modules within modules and so on at different levels of organization. And so this can be characterized in the brain using techniques such as hierarchical clustering or variants of that. So for example, this is a uh, analysis trying to petition structural connectivity of the human brain and cluster areas with similar connectivity profiles at different levels. So you've got a dendrogram, and if you cut that dendrogram at different levels, so here we find 15 clusters, that's what they look like. We go to 100 clusters, that's what they look like, 50, 250, and so on. So you can cut the dendrogram at different levels and pick out a particular level uh, of organization. You can also see that if you look at the adjacency matrix of a human brain network. So this is a structural connectivity network. Uh, as, as you were doing yesterday, this is being ordered to emphasize the modular organization of the network. So you can see there's very clearly defined modules, one, two, three, four. But if you look within, you can see that perhaps you could also divide this large module into one, two, three modules. And perhaps here, yeah, this module could be broken into another three modules. And even here, maybe you could find two sub-modules. Right? So you could potentially go through different levels of resolution and find these nested modules. So then the question is, if there is this multi-scale organization, well, you can pick any 
any single level, or is there some kind of optimum partition? And so obviously techniques such as hierarchical clustering have been around for quite a while, but uh, you know, this, this kind of question of is there a way to define an optimal partition really took hold in network science, uh, largely on the back of work by Mark Newman uh, and, and Gertman, where they thought about, well, how could we define the quality of a good partition? Right? What's a good way to cluster uh, a given data set? or a network. And so they said, okay, well, in a good partition, we should find that nodes within the same module are strongly connected with each other. That makes sense, that's the definition of a module. But that means that trivially, you could place all the nodes within a single module, and that would give you a, quite a good answer. So there's something else there that we need to think about. And they say, well, the other property is that the degree of connectivity within a module should be greater than chance. Right? So, if you just place all nodes within a single module and you look at what you would expect by chance, that wouldn't be greater than chance. And so then you have a bad petition if you tried to account for these two criteria. So how can we then define a measure that captures these two properties? Like this, uh, that's the short answer. So they define this metric called the Q index. And so I'm just going to break this down for you. So you can see there's a sum here, so it's over all pairs of nodes, rj. But we've got this delta function here. And this, this whole expression equals 1 if the module of node i is the same as the module of node j, and 0 otherwise. So you can see that if this becomes 0, then everything gets multiplied by 0 and we have 0. So we're really only considering pairs of nodes within the same module. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. So we take pairs of nodes within the same module, and then we say, OK, what's the observed connectivity? Right? So are these two nodes within the same module connected or not? And what do we expect by chance? And so we subtract what we expect by chance from what we observe. And then we do that for every pair of nodes in the same module. And we normalize that by the total number of edges. And that's our Q index, right? So it's really just the difference between the connectivity we get within modules and the connectivity we expect by chance. That means that values near zero imply that the level of modularity in the network does not differ from chance expectations, because really what we're talking about is the difference between observed and expected. So if we're subtracting one from the other and it's zero, then they're basically the same. Whereas if you get a value near 1, so 1 is the maximum, if you get a value near 1, we've got a very modular partition, a strong modularity. So we've got much higher connectivity within modules than we expect by chance. Are there any questions? What are the criteria to define a module? Yep, so we'll get into that. So. This is saying how do we define a good partition, and then there's the question of how we define those partitions. So that's that's coming up. But first, I just want to talk about what defines a good partition. So the question then is, what is our chance expectation? What is this EIJ term? How do we define that? Is there So, so the question is, is there another coefficient you could add in there to look at hierarchy? And that's an excellent question, and I'll talk about that. Could you slide it back over the edges? Sorry? Could you slide it back over the edges? Yes, that's this 2B. Because this is an undirected network, and so over in the sum we're counting things twice. And so if it was a directed network, it would just be like uh, so the question is, how do we define this chance expectation? It's defined like this. So in the, in the typical standard definition, uh, which is suitable for a binary undirected network, it's the degree of node i times the degree of node j over the total number of edges. And this is, it can be shown that this is the probability of an edge falling between node i and j by chance under something called a configuration model, which is um, a way of defining random graphs with a particular degree 
with an arbitrary degree distribution. So generally, in binary undirected networks, and I mean it's often applied in lots of other cases, this is how we define our chance expectation. So then the question is, does our observed connectivity exceed this value? In weighted networks, uh, we substitute the degree with the strength. So remember, node strength is just the sum of the weights attached to a node. And we normalize by the total weight of the network. So we just sum all the weights in the network. So it's you know, basically the same idea as in the binary case. Now, in correlation-based networks, it's a little bit different. So the null model I've just been talking about assumes that edges are formed independently at random. But in correlation networks, as we've been discussing, the edges aren't independent. Right? So because of this triangle closure property, if A is connected to B and A is connected to C, then uh, B and C are also going to have some non-trivial correlation. So there's been a bit of debate as to what an appropriate null model for a correlation-based network should be. One suggestion has been to just take the mean weight across the entire network. And then we're saying, well, does the connectivity within modules exceed what uh, exceed the mean across the entire network? Um, yeah, so basically you're evaluating intramodule connectivity relative to the average connectivity of the network. Now, in correlation networks, we can also have signed weights. So we can have positive and negative edges. So the question is, how do we deal with negative edges? So if you think about it, a good partition, generally we would think that positive correlation implies that nodes are working together. So we would want nodes with strong positive correlations to be within the same modules. So a good partition would have lots of positive weights within modules. Whereas negative weights imply that nodes are perhaps in some kind of competition or antagonism. And so we wouldn't want lots of negative weights in the same module. We would expect those weights to fall between modules. So we can then define Q just on the positive weights. So we take, we look at all the positive weights and we define Q as per our standard definition. And then we do the same separately for the negative weights. Right? So this is the, the superscript here. We're just doing the negative weights. And we subtract the Q for negative weights from the Q for positive weights. So this is saying, if we've got high Q for negative weights, which means there's lots of negative edges within a module, then that's going to penalize this overall Q score because we're subtracting it from the positive. So we'll get a high Q here if we've got, uh, if we've got high, or a lot, high positive weight within modules and low negative weight within modules. Now additionally, so this is a definition proposed by Mika Rubonov and Olaf Swans in 2011. You can see that this negative modularity term is scaled by this factor, which is the total weight of the network. So we're looking at both positive and negative. Whereas the positive component is scaled just by the positive weight. So basically this is kind of uh, more heavily downweighting the influence of negative modularity. And the rationale behind this is that a positive weight explicitly tells you something about the modules to which two nodes belong. If two nodes are strongly positively correlated, you say, well, they should go together. Whereas a negative weight tells you that two nodes don't belong together, but it doesn't tell you anything about which module the node should belong to. So there's a bit of a kind of uh, asymmetry in the information you get from that, and they're just trying to account for it in this way. I mean, this is, this is an arbitrary scaling fact that you could choose any other uh, scaling factor. Um, alternatively, you could make this completely symmetric, in which case you would just normalize by uh, the positive weight. But this, this particular quality function uh, is implemented in, in well, both this and a symmetric are implemented in the brain connectivity toolbox. So magic weights is a mean, is a mean directionality? Sorry? The, the magic weights of this context is a mean directionality? No, so this is for undirected networks. But if you think about a correlation network, a correlation could either be positive or negative. So the sign here is saying, well, this is just we're taking looking at all the negative correlation values, and this is looking at all the positive correlation values. So you're saying that the negatively correlated 
nodes are less connected. Well, you wouldn't say less connected. So the question is, how do you interpret a negative correlation? And I guess this is a kind of uh, topic that's open to discussion. But within this framework, we're saying, well, we would generally think that two areas that have got a negative correlation, you know, the interpretation is, well, they're in some kind of competition or antagonism, so maybe they, they shouldn't be in the same functional system. They should be in different systems. So we prefer solutions that are going to place them in different modules. Um, and that's, that's the assumption here. It depends on how you want to interpret it. You might say, well, I think that strong negative correlations means that two nodes do belong in the same system. And then you might just take the absolute correlation value of the computer standard Q function or something like that. Um, so it does very much depend on how you choose to interpret the negative correlations. I mean, if the signs here represented excitatory and inhibitory interactions, you know, I mean, at the neuronal level, there's no reason to think that you wouldn't have inhibitory connections within a module, right? So maybe this is less appropriate. Okay, so that's different ways of defining the quality of a petition. So given that, we know what a good petition looks like, so then the question is, how do we generate a petition that maximizes Q, right? We want to generate a petition of the network, we want to put nodes in modules such that this quality metric, this Q, is maximized. And it turns out that this is a very difficult problem. So uh, it's been shown that this uh, particular problem is what's called NP-complete, which means non-deterministic polynomial time complete, which uh, in more sensible language means that you know, there's no way of solving this problem in reasonable time because the computation time grows very quickly as the size of the network increases. And so this graph just shows that as you increase the size of the network, so uh, N here, the number of possible petitions increases very rapidly. So by the time we get to a network of around 38 nodes, we've got uh, 10 to the 30 different petitions. And yeah, by comparison, there's 10 to the 24 stars in the universe and 10 to the 82 atoms. So these are literally astronomical numbers. And you know, most brain networks are in the regime of 100 to 1,000 nodes. So there's no way we could do an exhaustive search of all possible petitions and find the optimum uh, petition. So that means that we have to use heuristics. And uh, there's lots of different heuristic algorithms for trying to find a petition that gives you an approximately optimum Q. The one I'm going to talk about today is the Louvain algorithm. It's a very popular algorithm because it's quite fast and generally pretty accurate. Um, and it's implemented in the BCT, and this is the one that we'll be using in the practical class. So the basic idea is you start with all nodes in a distinct module. So you say each node is a distinct module. And then you choose a node at random, and you merge it with another node such that you get the greatest gain in Q. All right, so every node is a different module. You've got a particular value of Q for that petition. Then you merge, you pick a node at random, and you say, okay, well, which other node can I place it with that's going to lead to the largest gain in Q? Right? And then you repeat this process until you don't get any more gains in your Q measure. And then you end up with something like this. You get an initial petition. This is what's called a greedy, optimiza greedy optimization step. And then what you do is you form a meta network. So you collapse all of the nodes within a module into a single node. So all the green ones go into a single node, all the blue ones become a single node. And then you've got these self edges, which is the, the, the connectivity within a module, so all the connections within a module. And then you've got these edges between these nodes that are the connections between modules. So you can see here there's one link between this green and red module, so then we assign a one to the edge linking the green and red. So we create this meta network, got our within module edges, our between module edges, and then we repeat this step. And we keep doing this steps two to three until we can get no further gains in Q. Right. The 
there any questions about that? So uh, the, this is the weights on these edges are the number of edges between modules. So if you look at all of these green nodes become this node, all of these red nodes become this node, and you can see there's only one edge between any of the green or any of the red. So then we assign a weight, a weight of one. No, I'm asking you what is that within module that is? What's this? Within, within module that is that is yeah. Ah, so this is the number of edges within a module. So uh, all the edges within the blue, but it's actually double. So we, we, we count it twice. Yeah. So there's two here, and then there's four here. So the slides are going to be available, so you can kind of work through this. <coughs> Yeah, that's right. So, you know, to get to get to this point, yeah. so we you know, we start with every node in its own module. Then we say, okay, pick a node at random, and then I look at every other node and I say, if I merge you, what's my Q? If I merge you, what's my Q? So I choose the largest gain in Q, merge that, and then I repeat that process, and I just keep going until I can't get any more uh, gain in Q, and that's what I end up with. And then you merge these into the meta network and then you repeat the process. Yeah. Each time you get a, a, each time you get a different queue. So you should uh, do this uh, for making this, this step for adoption. That's a very good point. I'm going to talk about how we do that. So basically when you're, because since it's random, so you get a different number every time. So you get a different because, you know, it's going to cluster in a different way, right? Yep. So, so uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Are there any other questions? What's this saying how is this different to k-means clustering? Yeah, yeah. So with k-means you have to tell the algorithm how many clusters to extract. Yeah. This you don't. Right. It's but, this. but uh, when you do k-cluster, you do, uh, when you tell uh, the, but when you it's finished, you should uh, have a filter for this uh, cluster if you learn about. Uh, Same with hierarchical clustering. When you make for k cluster. Oh, sorry, what do you get for, for k So maybe speaking from one. I just wanted to say that uh, when you uh, have a uh, judge about whether you do the k cluster very well, at this point, it is the same way as q. So you're saying if you optimize the number of clusters, right? So if you evaluate same means for different number of clusters and you choose the most optimal yeah. pay, you say yeah. relate compared to modularity. Oh, would you get the same result? Yeah. Um, not necessarily. So you know they're they're optimizing different things, so you can get different results. Um, it's like you know the challenge with something like k-means is how do you choose your k? So the advantage of this approach is that you don't have to set this parameter a priori. In principle, you know, you could do a hierarchical clustering and measure Q at each level in the dendrogram and pick the, you know, cut the tree at the level with the highest Q. And that's initially what this um, one of the applications of this of this metric model was developed for. Um, but this is a bit more general in that in, in principle it should find the optimum partition. Now, as, as you guys have picked up, this is uh, a stochastic algorithm. And so each time you run it, you're going to get slightly different results. And it turns out that this is a property of uh, just about every 
algorithm that tries to optimize Q. And if you actually run these algorithms lots and lots of times and you look at the Q values, you know, so one, one solution would be, well, I'm just going to run this a thousand times and I'll pick the solution with the highest Q. But if you actually plot the Q landscape across lots of runs of the same algorithm on the same data set, it's very jagged. It looks like this. And you, can't, you can see that there's no real clear peak. Right? So this is what's said to be uh, a degenerate landscape. So there's potentially lots of different solutions that are roughly as good as each other. Right? And so then that means, well, what should I pick? So one solution is to use a consensus clustering approach. So the idea is, say, I'll start with my connectivity matrices. And then for, every, for any given matrix, I run the algorithm lots of times. Let's say I run it n times. So in this case, I run it three times. And I've got slightly different solutions each time with a bit of a different Q value. And then across the runs, I estimate what's called an agreement matrix. And so this matrix just plots the number of times that two nodes were in the same module across those n runs. Right, so I look at this run. For every pair of nodes, I say, were you in the same module? Yes, that's a 1. Were you in the same module? No, that's a 0. So I get this matrix. Uh, I develop this matrix for this run, this run, this run. I do it for n runs. And then I can take the sum or the mean across those runs to get either the number of times or the proportion of times the two nodes are in the same module. So I get this agreement matrix or a co-classification matrix. And then we threshold this at some level some nominal level, it's up to us. And then we run community detection or modularity analysis on this matrix another n times. And then we repeat these steps until we get convergence. And by the end, you'll end up with a block diagonal matrix where uh, all the nodes within the same module will have a 1, and all nodes in different modules will have a 0. Right? Because each time you sort of threshold in the network, and so eventually it converges to this state. And that's your final consensus uh, estimate. And then optionally, you can do this across subjects. Right? So you do it within a subject, you get a consensus. Then you do it across subjects. So you just treat each subject as a different instance. And then you can get like a group level representation of the modular organization on the network. And in this case, we find two modules. Any questions about that? Um, off the top of my head, not in detail, uh, the initial paper talked a little bit about burying the threshold of the number, and I think they sort of said, well, by the time you run it x times, you get a stable solution. I can't remember the exact number there. Okay. It's in, all the details are in this paper, Lake Chichen and So, uh, when you talk about the <coughs> that, is it a similar uh, maximizing? Well, so, so the question is, is optimizing modularity the same as maximizing modularity? So I guess if, if you're saying that your Q index is your measure of modularity, then yeah, these algorithms are trying to maximize that. Now, they can't maximize it in an absolute sense, well, I mean, you know, because it's very hard to find a clear peak, and that's why we do this consensus cluster. Any questions about that? Good. So one limitation of modularity is that it has what's called a resolution limit. And that means that it can struggle to find small modules. So as I said, most of these algorithms merge nodes into a single module if they get a gain in Q. And this gain occurs if the number of edges linking two modules, say A and B, is greater than we expect by chance. So we can rewrite what we expect by chance as this, where capital K means the number of connections within module A and the number of connections within module B. And, uh, and this is the number of edges in the network. And so this, this, this value is going to be small if the network is very sparse and then we've got a small numerator, or if the network is large and we can have a large denominator. Right? So we're going to get a very small value of chance expected connectivity. And in certain cases, it can actually be less than one. So 
So in the case of a binary network, we can have an expectation for chance that is less than uh, the minimum edge weight, which is one. And then that means that nodes are going to get merged and they're going to be, the modules are going to be bigger, and so you're going to lose sensitivity to detect small modules. Oops. So, yeah, the causes of bias against detecting small modules. And so this can be shown in this simple network here. So this is a simple ring network, and so each of these gray nodes corresponds to a fully connected click of five nodes, right? So each of these gray nodes is actually five nodes that are fully connected with each other. And then each of these clicks has only one link between them. So you would expect the optimum partition would place each of these gray nodes within a separate module. But what we find is that they get placed together into modules of size 2. So the empirical Q we get is 0.87, and what we would expect if every node was in its own module is 0.86, so slightly lower. So the algorithm is doing what it's supposed to. It's giving you a solution with a higher Q, but it just comes down to the limitations of this null model. Right? So then one option to deal with this is to add in this scaling factor gamma. So these equations are the same. We've just added this gamma term to EIJ. And this is just a multiplicative factor, right? So if we make gamma large, it's going to uh, increase the influence of the error term. And so we're going to be biased towards detecting smaller communities. If we make gamma small, then we're going to be biased towards detecting larger modules. And if gamma is equal, uh, if, if gamma equals 1, then we've just got the same as standard modularity. So you can think of this as a more specific case of this more general definition. Now, it's been shown that even this approach can have certain biases, but this is one way that you could look at multi-scale organization of this approach. The question is, or well, the issue is, you know, gamma, how you set gamma can be a little bit arbitrary, so you need to think about that. Are there any questions about that? So earlier on the previous slide, you showed this ring, the range of the ring. So um, what does that mean? So this is just a, a, it's a toy network, right? So each of these nodes, each of these gray nodes, is actually five nodes. So you've got to think of it as subsets of five nodes that are fully connected with each other. So then you would think that realistically this network, each of these subgroups of five should be a separate module. Right? Because you know, they're fully connected with each other, there's only one link between them. So if we're going to do it, if we we're going to partition this network here, we would say, well, this is one module, this is another module. Right? So if we were just going to do a modular partition of this network, we'd say this should be one module, this should be another module. So, you know, let's let's extend this out and say, well, each of these points is one of these sub subgraphs of five. So we would expect, you know, a box around each gray node. But what we find if we run a standard Q optimization algorithm is it places these two, it places adjacent sets into a single module. So it's basically saying all of these belong in one module. And that's because of this resolution limit issue. Yeah, they're not able to pick up small. Yeah, there's a bit of a bias that, that struggles. It's, so if, so it depends if this network is sufficiently large. So if you've got less nodes, then it does OK. But as you increase the size of the network, it uh, makes this term smaller, and then you see this bias. Uh, usually, if you're going to do Q optimization, you want to use consensus clustering to account for the stochastic nature of the, of the algorithm. And then, if you're looking at a sample of individuals, you could optionally generate a group level partition. Because obviously, the question is you know, once I've got, if I've got 20 subjects and I do a separate partition in each of them, how then do I 
work out what a representative petition is, what you could do consensus, consensus clustering to do that. We're going to do that in Pratt. And then optionally, you can use this gamma parameter to look at multi-resolution architecture. And then once you can do that, you can go and generate results such as this. So this, this was a study from Jonathan Power a few years ago where they tried to say, well, you know, what are the, the modules or the subsystems of the brain? And you know, using these techniques, they're able to pull out things that correspond with the results you get from a lot of other techniques such as ICA and so on. You can see there's fault mode network in red, sensory mode network in blue, frontal prior system in yellow, and so on. Now, the nice thing about modularity analysis is that once we have our modules, we can understand the role that individual nodes play within the network by looking at their within module and between module connectivity. So one way of looking at within module connectivity is to estimate something called the within module degree. So uh, that's simply a Z score. So we've got, you know, we're looking at it, it's a nodal measure, so taking node I. This is the degree of node I within its module. So the number of connections a node has to other nodes in the same module. Subtracted from the mean within module connectivity of that module over the standard deviation. So it's basically a z-score of the within module connectivity. And it's telling you what the z-score of that node is. So you can see this node here, if these are four modules, this node here is connected to every other node in the same module. So it acts as a local hub, right? Presumably plays an important role in the functional specialization of that particular module. And so nodes with high within module degree are called provincial hubs, generally. Well, no, I'll come back to that now. Now between module connectivity, look at this guy here. He's connected to a few other nodes in the same module, but he's also got connections to every other module. So you would assume that this node plays an important role in integrating the functions of different modules. Right? And so here we've got this kind of dual roles, one important for specialization, the other important for integration. Now we can quantify this using this measure here called the participation coefficient. So again, it's estimated for a given node. We sum over all modules and we look at the number of connections node I has to each module M over its total degree. So it's looking at how, uh, how a node's connections are distributed across modules. So if a node has an even distribution of connections across modules, it's going to have high participation coefficient. And what is commonly done is to do something that's called, uh, has been called functional cartography. So basically you plot where nodes sit in this kind of ZP space. So you got the within module Z score on the Y axis, the participation coefficient on the X axis, and you plot where nodes sit. So in this toy network here, you can see that uh, this particular node, which corresponds to this one, has low participation coefficient, right? All of its connections are within the same module, but it's very highly connected within that module. It's connected to all the other nodes, so it's got low participation, but high within module connectivity. And this is what we call a provincial hub, right? The idea is that it's locally important within its own network. Compare that to this node here, where it's connected to three other modules, and also highly connected within its own module. So this node here is what we would call a provincial hub. Right? It's highly connected within its own module, but also has connections that are distributed across lots of other modules. So it also plays an important role in uh, functional integration. So you can sort of, you know, wherever a node sits in this space, you can define the role that it plays in terms of its within module and between module connectivity. And this isn't just an abstract exercise. It seems like these measures have important practical consequences for how we think about the brain. So this was a really nice study done a few years ago where they took a bunch of patients with lesions in different brain areas and they looked at the properties of those lesioned areas and they kind of, they divided people into Patients that have lesions in areas with high participation, so that's uh, the circles, 
So these are areas with a high participation coefficient. So they played an important role in integrating diverse modules. And they looked at patients with lesions with high within module degree. So these are the diamonds. So here we've got the within module degree group and the high participation group. So each column is a different patient. And each row is performance in a different cognitive domain. And the color represents that there was an impairment in that domain. And so you can see that for the patients with lesions to areas that have got high within module degree, the impairments are quite focal and specific to particular cognitive domains. Whereas for patients with high participation, they've got pretty global cognitive impairments uh, spread across different cognitive domains. And this is what you would predict if you get a lesion to an area that plays an important role in integrating different subsystems of the brain then you would expect that there will be a more pervasive global pattern of cognitive impairment compared to an area that uh, perhaps has a more specific role within a particular functional subsystem. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So that's modules and modularity. And we're going to do a crack to work through that analysis. So another question is centrality. So Andrew talked yesterday about looking at degrees and degree distributions and how we might think about hubs. But that's in a, in a, in a quite narrow sense. So that's defining a hub based on the number of connections it has. But there are more subtle aspects uh, of thinking about the role that a node plays that might not necessarily be just simply driven by the number of connections it has, but where it sits in a network. And so this is what we start thinking about when we're talking about centrality. So broadly, we could define centrality as the capacity of a node to influence or be influenced by other nodes. And because we're dealing with networks and we're talking about topology, this capacity is really driven by its topological position in its network, so in the network, so where it sits in the network. And so there's lots of different measures of centrality that have been defined. And there's lots of different ways of thinking about centrality. A nice heuristic way of, of approaching this area is to borrow an idea from Freeman, published in 1978, where he said, well, all these different measures of centrality, really, they come down to what we can think of as three core aspects of what a central node should look like. And so what should a central node look like? Well, let's take this simple graph here, a star kind of configuration. We've got one node in the center, and these guys on the outer. Now, it's not very controversial to say that this guy in the center is topologically central, right? plays an important role in the network, and these guys are more peripheral. So what are the properties of this node? Well, he's maximally connected to every other node, he's connected to all the other nodes, so it has high degree. The other thing is that it falls, it's, it's maximally close to other nodes, so it's only one connection away from every other node. So it's got a very short average path length to other node. So you, know, you can think of this as being topologically close. So it's got high closeness to all the other nodes. And the other thing is that it falls on all the shortest paths between nodes. So the shortest path between this node and this node has to go through this red node. Same for the others. So the third property is that it falls on the shortest path between nodes. And so these kind of properties can be used to sort of categorize or think about different aspects of centrality. So let's talk about degree-based centrality first. So on the one hand, we've got degree, where we just count the number of connections attached to a node. This is what Andrew talked about yesterday. So uh, you know, typically denoted as K, and we just sum all of the entries in the adjacency matrix attached to a node. And so for each row or column, we just sum all those values, and that's our degree. Another measure that uh, looks at something more uh, subtle is what's called eigen. Oh, no, so sorry, I should say. And as we talked about yesterday, you know, different networks can be characterised by the degree distribution. So how degree is distributed across nodes. So in a random case, we've got a sort of Gaussian-looking distribution. In a scale-free case, which is very dominated by hubs, we've got a power law where there's a very long tail, and these guys, these guys are the hubs. Now, a more subtle way of thinking about it is to use a measure called eigenvector centrality. And this measure accounts not only for the direct connections attached to a node shown in red, 
but also the connections of its neighbors. So it's not just looking at how many connections do I have, but who am I connected to? Because that might play an important role as well. So we've got this network here. Take these two nodes. They've both got a degree of three, but this guy connects to nodes that connect to other nodes. So you would think, well, this one probably has a more influential role in the network. Right? And so this is what eigenvector centrality tries to uh, account for. It's saying it's not just nodes with high eigenvector centrality can have high degree, well, you'll get high eigenvector centrality if you have high degree, and you're also connected to other high degree nodes. And it's estimated by simply taking the principal eigenvector of the adjacency matrix. And it's basically the, the value a given node has in that eigenvector. And it can be written like this. So um, uh, this is just an expression saying that it's driven by a node's connectivity and also the centrality of the other node. So xi is the value of node i on the principal eigenvector. xj is the value of node j on the principal eigenvector. So the centrality of node i can be expressed as its degree multiplied by the centrality of its neighbors. And these two measures are correlated Degree and eigenvector centrality are correlated to some extent, but not perfectly, so they give you different information. So this was an analysis looking at voxel-wise networks in fMRI. So they plotted the scatter plot between eigenvector centrality and degree centrality. So you can see the sort of two clusters of nodes. There's one where there's a very high, uh, very sharp correlation, and there are nodes that have got very high eigenvector centrality and high degree. Then there's another set of nodes where you can get moderate levels of degree, uh, uh, sorry, fairly low eigenvector centrality but high degree. And so it's likely that this cluster of nodes, they're kind of within module hubs, so provincial hubs, so they're probably connected to a lot of other nodes that don't connect to lots of other nodes, whereas these nodes are both hubs and they connect to other hubs. Any questions about that? Yeah, that, that's just it's just a way of expressing it to kind of give you an intuitive understanding of uh, the idea that the centrality of a node can be expressed as its degree multiplied by the centrality of its neighbors. Right. Um, to actually estimate it, you just use a standard algorithm for pulling out the eigenvectors. So you do an eigen decomposition, and it's the principal eigenvector. And so if you actually look at, so that, I mean, there's a BCT function that you'll use in the prac. Um, called eigenvector centrality. If you actually look at the code, it's just using the MATLAB command, command for eigen decomposition. Uh, so that's degree-based centrality. And there's lots of other variants. So um, you know, eigenvector centrality can break down in certain cases, and so people have introduced scaling factors. And so page rank centrality, which is an important component of Google's search algorithm, is a variant of eigenvector centrality that has a, a couple of uh, uh, constants and tunable parameters in there. Now, the other type or class of centrality measures look at closeness. And so this is really looking at variants of average path length. So as Andrew mentioned yesterday, the original definition of closeness is just taking the inverse uh, of the average shortest path. But this won't do very well with fragmented networks because we can have infinite path lengths and if you take an average, you get infinity. So a revised definition that allows you to estimate the property in a fragmented network, we take the average of the inverse shorter path length. So here, we get the average path length, we take the inverse. Here, we get the inverse path lengths, and we take the average and we inverse it. Right, so that's so that, oh yeah, then you can inverse it. That's, uh, and so this, this definition is equivalent to regional efficiency. Now the last class of centrality measures is based on betweenness. And so betweenness, you just want to think about, so if you consider this network, this node has high degree. It's got four connections. This node's only got two connections. But 
if I was to ask you which one plays a more important role in network function, you could certainly make a case that this one does, because any message that wants to go from this set of nodes to this set of nodes has to pass through this one. So it acts like a kind of information processing bottleneck, even though it's got fairly low degree. So between the centrality is a way of trying to capture this behavior. And it's basically expressed as the proportion of shortest paths, so rho j k, so uh, j and k are any two pair of nodes that don't that it doesn't involve i. And so rho is the, the shortest path between j and k. So it's a proportion of shortest paths between j and k that pass through node i over the total number, oh, sorry, the number of shortest paths between j and k that pass through node i over the total number of shortest paths between j and k. So basically for every pair of nodes, you pick one node, then you look at every other pair of nodes, you find the shortest paths and you work out what's the proportion of shortest paths that pass through uh, node i. And then you normalize that by the, the total possible paths. And that's between the centrality. Now, it's important to point out that these different measures of centrality often carry with them implicit assumptions about the type of communication dynamics that are occurring on the network. And so a lot of these measures based on path length or shortest path lengths um, assume that information is going along the shortest path. And so one example of this is a sort of serial transfer where if we've got a signal, it starts at a node, it knows where it wants to go, so it follows the shortest path, so at time one it starts here, then it moves to this node, and then it moves to that node. Right? Now you could imagine that this is probably characteristic of how uh, the mail service works. The post office gets a letter, it knows where it needs to go, and it tries to find the shortest route to get there. And each point the letter gets passed on at each uh, stage along the way. Another potential uh, way for communication is serial, serial duplication. In this case, Whatever happens at a node stays at a node, but then moves on to another node. Okay. And a kind of more generalized version is something like parallel duplication, where something happens at a node, it then impacts the nodes to which it's connected, and it spreads throughout the network. And so you can imagine this is kind of uh, similar to something like uh, a computer virus, where it infects one computer and gets emailed out to uh, all the contacts in someone's contact list, they get infected, and, and so on. And another potential model is diffusion, where something happens in a node, then it activates its neighbors, but then this node goes back to its basal state, and then that propagates forward in a kind of blind process. Now, a lot's been said about, you know, so shortest paths have been used a lot to characterize brain networks, but it, as Andrew mentioned yesterday, it's unlikely that uh, any single node has this global layout of the network and it knows how to find the shortest path. What seems more likely is something may be similar to a diffusion process. And so then that means that you know, instead of using these shortest path me measures, maybe it's more appropriate to use diffusion-based measures of centrality. And so Andrew mentioned yesterday there's communicability, which looks at all paths between pairs of nodes of different lengths. Uh, so you basically look at all possible paths of length n weighted by factorial n, so that means that longer paths uh, get weighted down more heavily, so they make less of a contribution to this final value. And uh, this has been shown to be an interesting predictor of functional connectivity. So in this study of macaques, they uh, pharmacologically lesioned the amygdala, and they looked at the change in functional connectivity to other areas. And they were able to predict that change based on the structural communicability between uh, pairs of areas. Uh, more so than they were able to do based on shortest path length alone. So suggesting that these kind of diffusion-based metrics do contain perhaps something additionally valuable to tell us about brain function. Uh, so running a bit behind, so the last topic I Between hub and Centrality. So the question was, what's the difference between hubs and centrality? So it depends on how you define hubs. So the simplest definition is a hub is a measure with lots of connections, so it has high degree. 
and degree you could think of as a measure of centrality. Right? So uh, if you think centrality is the influence that a node can exert on other nodes, or the influence that it receives, then a node with lots of connections will have a high level of centrality. But degree isn't the only way of measuring centrality. There's all these other different ways. And in some cases, like in the case of the betweenness centrality, you might have a node with low degree, but it still might play an important role in network function. So uh, it, it depends on your concept of centrality and how you want to define it. And so different types of centrality will give you different types of information about what a node is doing. And you, know, you could define a hub based as a node with high between the centrality, if you like. But typically, the more standard definition is a node with high degree. And generally, uh, if you've got a de degree distribution with a long tail, then that means it's a hub because it's got a very disproportionate number of connections. So the last thing I want to talk about is cores and clubs. So we've looked at modules, and that's one way of identifying kind of cohesive subsets of nodes. But you know, what if I want to say, well, you know, is there a kind of single information processing core of my network? Like a, a subset of very central nodes that are strongly connected with each other. And one way of looking at this is to use a technique called K-core decomposition. And broadly you can say the K-core is the subgraph of nodes comprising nodes with degree greater than or equal to K. So the basic idea is we take a network and then we remove nodes with degree less than a value and we look at the remaining nodes and then that, that subset of remaining nodes is the, uh, the, the K core of that network at a particular level of K. And we keep doing that for different levels of K. So we'll just run through the algorithm. Now so we've got this network here. All of these nodes have a degree of at least one. So we could say this is the one core. So let's increase this now. Let's say, okay, well, let's get rid of all nodes with a degree less than two. So we remove all of these nodes. So these orange nodes become the two cores. So they've all got a degree less than two. Now, the critical thing is that if you remove nodes with a degree less than one, so we get rid of this node, this node, this node, this node, this node. If I do that, then I have to look at the degree of the remaining nodes. And in this case, this node initially had a degree of 3, but after I remove these nodes with degree of 1, its degree drops to 1, so then it gets dropped as well. It doesn't make it into the 2 core. Right? So you remove all nodes with a degree of 1, we get our 2 core, and then we say, okay, well, let's move k up again. Let's find the 3 core. And then we do that, and these are the nodes that are remaining that have a degree of at least 3. So we can do that for all of the values of degree in our network. And you know, the idea is that the, no, you know, the nodes at the last level are perhaps the real key core of the network. And so you can get this sort of onion-like view of the brain. So these, the lines of this circle represent a different K shell. So we peel the network at a different level of K. And we put a marker at a point to say this is the highest level of K that a node got to. So as we're moving inside, we're getting to higher levels of K. This has been uh, divided into different modules. So each color represents a different module, and that's the anatomy there. And so this is just showing that across all the different brain modules, you get nodes belonging to almost all the different levels of K. Right? So these sort of central core nodes seem to be distributed across different systems of the brain. That's in the case of binary networks, we can use a similar idea in weighted networks where instead of looking at degree or K, we look at node strength, so the sum of weights attached to a node. So we look at all of our unique strength values in the network and we peel the network at different levels and this is a representation of the S-core in uh, a human brain network. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about is rich clubs. So you've probably heard a bit about this uh, if you're familiar with the network literature at all. So, Think, let's think about different types of network organizations. So on the one hand, I can have a modular network, and you know, these are kind of the nodes that have got high participation because they're linked to nodes in other modules. But we could have something like this, where all of these uh, nodes, these hub nodes, are also connected with each other. And this type of organization is consistent with what we call rich club organization. 
So the idea is that the richest nodes of the network, so the nodes with high degree, we call them rich because they've got a high degree, form a club. So the richest nodes of the network are also interconnected with each other. So you can think about this in terms of, say, you know, the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies doing a lot of business with each other, uh, or uh, you know, Hollywood actors being more likely to date each other. You can think about this in sort of uh, lots of different contexts. But in the kind of network context, we define richness traditionally in terms of degree, and we look at the connectivity between them. So this is how we define what's called the rich club coefficient. So this is looking at how, you know, to the extent to which we can see a rich club. So at a given level of K, a given level of degree, we find all of the edges between nodes with a degree greater than K, and we normalize that between the total possible edges. So the numerator is just the number of edges between nodes with a degree greater than a given k. The, num the denominator is just the total possible. So really what we have is the connection density of the subgraph of nodes with a degree greater than k. Right? So what's the proportion of connections I get between nodes with a degree greater than k? Now why is this dependent on k? Well, because how I choose to define a hub can be arbitrary, right? We've got this continuous degree distribution, where do I set a cutoff for defining a hub? It's kind of arbitrary. So what we do is we measure this value across all degrees of k. So we've got along the x-axis, we're cutting it at different levels of k, so as we move higher, we're getting into the real hubs of the network, and we measure this quantity, this phi coefficient, this rich club coefficient. So you can see in this case of the internet, we get an increase. So that's implying that as we get to higher levels of k, as we get into the hubs, they're very strongly or densely connected with each other. We can do the same with the air transportation network. We see similar behavior. But we also see similar behavior with a completely random graph, an erdos Remy graph. And this is because uh, as you threshold the network at higher levels of degree, you're ending up with the most highly connected nodes. And chances are they're going to be connected with each other anyway, just by chance. So we want to account for this. And so it's typical to normalize this value by what we see in a random graph. So here we've got the observed rich club coefficient, here we've got the average in some randomized networks. So we end up with this normalized rich club coefficient. And then typically what we do is we plot this normalized value as a function of k. So this is data from C. elegans and the mouse. At the top we've got the degree distribution. And here the black line is the observed coefficient. The gray area is the range of values we get in randomized networks, and the red value is the normalized coefficient. So basically the black divided by the mean of the gray. And so what you can see is as we get to higher levels of degree, and then as we get to about a degree of 40, where we're really in the tail of the distribution, right? So these are the hubs of the network, we see a sharp increase in this normalized coefficient. So we're seeing a much higher density of connections between hub nodes than we expect by chance. And so a red dot here means that it's significantly different from the nulls. We see the same behavior in the mouse. Once we get to a degree of about 43 or so, we're in the tail of the distribution, these are the hubs, we see very dense interconnectivity. Right? So we're just saying, how densely interconnected are these hubs, these nodes that are in the tail of the distribution? I'm just going to kind of zip through this because uh, we're a bit behind. If there's any questions, come and, come and get me in the break. Um, now, if we want to do the same in a weighted network, we obviously need to think about the influence of weights. And so uh, a common definition poses a question as, well, are the strongest weights in the network on the links between the hubs? Right? So to do this, we first rank our nodes based on some measure of richness. So um, Use node degree, we could use node strength. We look at the total weight of the edges on that subgraph, and then we normalize that by the total weight of uh, the same number of edges after we've taken the same. Oh, sorry, let's, let me rephrase that. So, say that uh, I've cut the subgraph of, and I find a set of nodes that have a rank greater than R. Say there's L edges in this subgraph, I look at the total weight of those L edges. Then I rank all the weights in the network and I take the L most strongly weighted and I look at the total weight of that. 
and that's why I use to normalize. So here's a definition here. We've got the total weight of the subgraph with a rank greater than R. And here we've ranked our weights across the entire network from uh, strongest to weakest. And I take the top L strongest, and that's what I normalize by. So basically we're saying, you know, if, if all of the strongest weights in the network are on this subgraph of nodes greater than R, then I'm going to have a coefficient of 1. Right? If they're not, then I'm going to have a value less than 1. And just to kind of show this intuitively, this is what we get in a sort of binary which, which club. So I've got modules. Here are the hubs. They're densely connected with each other. The red are the rich. We could have uh, in this case, this is a network with no weighted rich club. So here, all of the strongest uh, edge weights, the thick lines, are within modules and not between the hubs. So there's no weighted rich club here, even though there's a binary rich club. And this is what a weighted rich club would look like. So all of the strongest weights in the network are on the connections between the hubs. Now the critical thing is, you know, I talked about how we normalize the values by uh, what we get in randomized networks. And so when we're dealing with weighted networks, we could either randomize where the edges are, we could randomize where the weights are on the edges, or we could randomize both. And the null model you use does affect the results you get. So this just shows in a brain network and the air transportation network, if we just randomize where the edges are, we see rich club. If we just randomize where the weights are, we don't. We randomize both we see a rich club. And so this paper goes into a lot of detail about the different types of null models you could use in this analysis and what it means. So anyone planning this analysis should uh, take a look at that. And this is just to say that uh, rich clubs are distributed throughout different subsystems. So here in blue we've got the locations of rich club areas. And then if you look at different functional networks, so visual, sensory, motor, frontal parietal, default mode, we find that there's nodes of the rich club that belong in each of these networks. And so this is consistent with that model of brain organization that I presented in the first lecture, where we've got these subsets of nodes that act as modules and they support uh, segregation and specialization of function. And then each of these nodes has one or more hubs and these hubs are densely interconnected with each other. And they form the rich club and this rich club supports integration between the modules. So, just to summarize, there's several different ways of measuring clustering and quantifying small worldness. Um, a lot of variations come from how we treat our edge weights and how we think about null models. Uh, modularity analysis is quite useful for looking at not only the network organization of the brain, but understanding the roles that different nodes play in the network. But you need to uh, take into account some of the limitations of the algorithms. Uh, we can define different aspects of node centrality. This can tell us about the role that different regions play, but we need to be mindful of the model of communication dynamics that each measure assumes. And uh, we can look at cores and rich clubs, and this can be a useful way of thinking about how different nodes play a, a role in, in functional integration in the brain. Uh, 